joining us. The, this afternoon, we, join, we are joined by the Vice Chiefs of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Space Force. Thank each of you for um, your meaningful military service and experience. Thank you all for being here. We're also joined by Diana Maurer of the GAO. Ms. Maurer, the work of um, the GAO has been invaluable to this committee over the years, and I thank you for taking time away from your many ongoing GAO reviews to be here with us. This hearing is an important opportunity for us to engage in a wide-ranging dialogue regarding the readiness of our armed forces, a topic of paramount importance for the security and well-being of our nation. Over the past few years, the global security landscape has evolved rapidly, presenting new and complex challenges to military readiness. <coughs> Excuse me. From ongoing conflicts in various regions to emerging threats and resource challenges, our armed forces must remain agile, adaptive, and prepared to address the full spectrum of operations. In this context, there are a number of areas I would like to highlight in particular. Continued access to training ranges across all domains remains critical. I know the Army is focused on the upcoming land lease renewals in Hawaii. During questions today, I'd like to hear more specifics regarding how the Army intends to weigh necessary training requirements while respectfully engaging with the Native Hawaiian community. Separately, the Navy has begun one of the most complex military construction projects in recent history to replace Dry Dock 3 at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. I have serious concerns about the significant cost increases this important project has already incurred and whether Navy leadership is taking the necessary steps to avoid future increases. My concerns with the Navy continue, ranging from the backlog of ship maintenance, lack of accountability for senior leaders in the wake of Red Hill, to allowing mission critical portions of the runway and facilities at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam to deteriorate. As you can see, just within the Indo-Pacific Theater alone, there are no shortage of readiness issues that require timely solutions. More broadly, in the area of quality of life issues, I would like to hear more from the witnesses on two topics. The first relates to how senior leaders are implementing the oversight and management reforms related to unaccompanied housing that were included in fiscal year NDAA 24. Taking care of our people by giving them a safe, clean place to live not only helps retention, but also our recruiting efforts, which have uh, are our challenge recently. The second topic relates to a troubling report the GAO re released earlier this year that found fatigue and sleep deprivation among service members continues to be a significant challenge. Chronic fatigue is directly related to the readiness of our forces uh, and it can lead to accidents, injuries, death, and monetary costs. Today, I encourage all witnesses to provide candid assessments, share best practices, and offer constructive recommendations. Together, we can ensure that our armed forces remain the world's preeminent fighting force capable of defending our nation's interests with unparalleled skill and resilience. I'd uh, once again like to thank each of you for coming forward today and for your leadership and insights. I look forward to your testimony and a productive discussion. Now I'm turning to Senator Sullivan for your remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I uh, really, really appreciate the witnesses and uh, their decades of service to our country. It's a very impressive group here. And um, thank you to you and your families and all the men and women that you lead. I also want to thank uh, Diana Maurer. I think the GAO on a lot of these issues does a really good job. So I appreciate uh, GAO being here as well. I had a really long opening statement that I was going to read. But since this is a readiness hearing with, uh, with the essentially the uh, service uh, our, our military vice chiefs of staff. Um, I'm just going to be a little bit more uh, direct. Um, I don't think our services are in a state of readiness that they need to be. 
given the threats. I think the one thing that everybody who focuses on our national security challenges would agree with is that we are in one of the most dangerous periods that we have seen facing the United States and our allies uh, since World War II. Secretary of Defense says this, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says this in their posture hearings. The President of the United States says this in his State of the Union. Um, I agree with that assessment. We have authoritarian dictators working together, China, Russia, bless you, North Korea, Iran, a little bit more junior jockey, Venezuela. Um, they are uh, not at all adverse to literally militarily invading their neighbor and slaughtering thousands and thousands of innocent civilians. We're seeing that, of course, in Israel. We're seeing that in Ukraine. We could see that any day in Taiwan. They are massively building up their militaries, massively, and um, we're not. I think the analogy to the mid to late 1930s is probably the closest thing that I've seen that's directly relevant to the situation we're seeing today. The big difference is, of course, uh, a lot of people forget to note in the late 1930s, our country under President Roosevelt did start building up our military. The Navy uh, fleet between 1937 and right before Pearl Harbor was almost tripled in size. Um, President Biden puts forward inflation adjusted cuts to our military every year. Uh, this budget this year shrinks the Army, shrinks the Navy, shrinks the Marine Corps. That's not what will impress Xi Jinping and Putin. The difficulty you gentlemen have is that you're motivated, honest military members. With four stars, credible service, I have the deepest respect for all of you. These are hard hearings for you. Here's why. Because in my assessment, you don't agree with the budget that the president put forward. You don't agree with shrinking the Army, shrinking the Navy, shrinking the Marine Corps. And yet, uh, you're military members. You have civilian control of this great republic that we uh, have oversight of. So you have to salute sharply and say, Roger that, I can do this. Your can-do military members. You don't want to do this. You don't think we need to cut defense spending. Um, next year, we could be on the pathway to below 3% of our GDP for um, the Department of Defense budget. My team and I have done some research on that. Um, there's been, I think, four or five times in the last 80 years we've been below 3% of GDP. Again, it's not a target. Anyone who's serious about national security thinks we should be hitting. But we might be hitting that due to the president's lack of seriousness on national security issues, lack of leadership on uh, uh, Pentagon issues. So, and finally, I think there's been a lack with the civilian leadership of this administration on lethality. You know, the Secretary of the Navy does his climate change action plan and he can't build ships. That's not serious. Uh, the Navy, in my view, is in a crisis. Can't build ships. The Chinese are cranking out 10 to 12 high-end surface warships every year, and we can't build one. So our readiness is tanking. It's our job as a Congress to try to get to the reasons why. I think I know the big reason why. This administration is not serious on it but to help you, to ask probing questions, to ask, ask difficult questions, some of which are really hard for you, gentlemen, because again, I don't think any of you agree with cutting the budget and shrinking the Navy and shrinking the Army and shrinking the Marine Corps, but that's the direction we're going. And it's dangerous, and we are sending the wrong signal to our adversaries. So I thank the chair for holding this hearing. It's a really important hearing. I have a ton of questions, so I hope we can go at least till about four o'clock, whether any other senators are going to be here or not, because this is really important. Our job as a Congress in terms of Article One, 
raise an army, provide and maintain a navy. That's our number one job in my view. And uh, we need to get on it because it's a dangerous world right now. And uh, my view is our forces are not ready. And that's what this subcommittee is supposed to be all about. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank my uh, uh, ranking member for uh, uh, raising the, the serious concerns he has. Uh, the fact is, of course, uh, SASC is uh, one of the few committees where we are able to come up with a pretty much a bipartisan uh, approach to what the military needs. And in addition, the, the department, uh, DOD is the only department that has what's uh, known as unfunded priority list that goes, that runs into the billions. So we uh, have an opportunity to weigh in on the, those uh, uh, spending issues that may not have made the cut, so to speak. So, you know, <laughs> this is already the biggest department and we spend the most money on defense than on anything else. So uh, we obviously have uh, a lot of areas to disagree on as well as to agree. So I thank the ranking member for his observations. With that, why don't we start with uh, General Mingus, the Vice Chief of Staff for the Army. Would you uh, give your testimony, please? Thank you. Chair Rono, Ranking Member Sullivan, other folks uh, that are here today, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the readiness of the United States Army. The Army is ready now to protect our nation and prevail in the toughest moments of combat. We are expanding the competitive space by increasing our lethality through our modernization efforts, strengthening American alliances through combined operations and training, and maximizing opportunities to improve the readiness of our soldiers and their families. The Army's readiness needs mirror the rapidly emerging changes in the character of war. Driven by network centricity, advances in sensors, hypersonics, robotics, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence. Armies can now increasingly see further, sense further, shoot further, engage remotely, and with increasing accuracy. Time is not on our side. And if we can quickly integrate and fuse these emerging technologies into advanced methods of warfare, we will maintain our decisive advantage in the current and future joint operating environment. Central to this effort is the health and effectiveness of our organic industrial base. During my visit to Scranton Army Ammunition Plant, I witnessed firsthand the success of our OIB modernization investments through the production of our new yield 155 round. And since Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, we have doubled the monthly produ production of 155 from 14,000 to 30,000. And by summer of 25, thank you to the supplemental, we will get to 100,000 rounds per month. As the Army invests in our warfighting capacity, we are simultaneously contributing to the integrated deterrence by supporting global campaigns and strategic partnerships, especially in the Indo-Pacific. While visiting the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii, I was impressed by the scale of preparation and meticulous efforts our soldiers are taking to build and maintain relationships, ensure interoperability, and foster integration with our allies and partners at the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, or JPMRC. A recent example is going on right now is that uh, capability is in the Philippines right now, training our partners. In Europe, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine highlights the pressing need to modernize our defensive capabilities, especially in the fields of unmanned systems and electronic warfare. The use of UAS Ukraine for reconnaissance and offensive roles have been a game changer. We are committed to enhancing our capabilities in these areas to ensure that we remain at the forefront of military innovation. We recently delivered both the Integrated Defeat System, commonly known as the Coyote, and the Directed Energy MSHORAD, the 50 kilowatt laser, to bolster our counter UAS defenses in US CENTCOM. Thank you. That said, the Army's FY25 budget request continues uh -huh. to prioritize our most ambitious transformation efforts in prioritizing critical areas like long-range precision fires, integrated air and missile defense, command and control, and con contested logistics. Finally, our greatest strength is the readiness of our people. We take care of our people by ensuring our soldiers are ready for combat with viable doctrine, equipment, realistic training, and simultaneously providing for their families with the resources they need to thrive at home. A key part of that responsibility is providing safe, high quality housing and barracks. During my recent visit to the 11th Airborne Division in Alaska, I witnessed instances of positive impact of our barracks arrangements. 
The initiatives that we're exploring are not just about physical changes, but it's about fostering stronger bonds among soldiers, their leaders, and promoting a culture of care. I want to emphasize that the Army is fully committed to funding our barracks, sustaining that at 100%, and we're also exploring the optimization of privatized barracks, starting with Fort Irwin, California, and other installations where that makes sense. We've also achieved historic progress in our retention, and we're optimistic about recruitment. We are transforming our recruiting enterprise to better compete with the job market that's out there. And our innovative future soldier prep course ensures that those that may not otherwise will meet the Army standard. In the end, I am confident that if called upon tonight, our Army can fight and win, and we're making the right choices to ensure we can also win in the future. That said, there's still a great deal of work to be done. And it is absolutely critical that we succeed in our transformation efforts to remain the most agile, lethal, and feared ground combat force in the world. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Admiral Kilby. Chair Hirono, Ranking Member Sullivan, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss Navy readiness. I appreciate the recent passing of the Security Supplemental, which will help us address unbudgeted operational costs affecting the United States Navy. Your Navy, as part of the Joint Force and alongside our allies and partners, remains postured and ready to fight and win. Today, with over 100 ships and 43,000 sailors deployed, your Navy operates around the world and around the clock, from seabed to space and in cyberspace. Our active and reserve shipmates and our Navy civilians are ready to preserve the peace, respond in crisis, and win decisively in war. The work requires a commitment to readiness, and I appreciate your efforts to ensure America's Navy remains the most powerful Navy in the world. We are strengthened, strengthening our Navy by focusing on three priorities, war fighting, war fighters, and the foundation that supports them. We place a primacy on war fighting. When Iranian-backed Houthis sought to disrupt the flow of global maritime train, trade, the Gerald R. Ford, Dwight D. Eisenhower strike groups, and the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group, four deployed destroyers from Rota, Spain, were there. Our sailors and Marines are effectively countering these threats. We are adapting in the Red Sea and applying lessons learned to prepare for a future high-end fight. Our ability to succeed in war fighting is inextricably tied to warfighter readiness. We are committed to improving the quality of service and that begins with taking care of our sailors, our civilians, and their families. In fiscal year 25, we are investing $1.4 billion in quality service. This augments the $165 million reprioritized into FY24 to improve unaccompanied housing. We are at a historically high levels of retention, but we face recruiting challenges this year as we did in 2023. But talent exists in every zip code and our efforts will help recruit and retain those who wish to answer our nation's call to service. Finally, the foundation. It underpins our warfighting and warfighter readiness. This includes our installations, which we must view as warfighting platforms, a point made clear in Guam. The devastation brought on by Typhoon Marwar is significant. I would appreciate your support for national disaster relief funding to address a number of challenges affecting our Navy. Readiness challenges exist in our shipyards as well. Since last November, I visited three of our four public shipyards. In FY25, we will invest $2.8 billion in our shipyard infrastructure optimization program to recapitalize those key components of Navy industry. Additionally, we're investing in the submarine industrial base as we ramp up production of the Columbia class and Virginia class submarines. These investments are vital to sustaining our undersea fleet and supporting our commitment to the AUKUS partnership. Our Navy has a culture that strives to think, act, and operate differently. We are committed to transparency, continuous learning, and working together to deliver the Navy our nation needs. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. General Mahoney. Good afternoon, Chair Hirono, Ranking Member Sullivan, and distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to represent your Marines this afternoon and discuss our current readiness and plans to remain ready in the future. The Commandant has outlined his priorities 
uh, first of which is to balance readiness with modernization. He does so as we confront a very difficult context, as has been brought up earlier. On the one hand, in the Pacific, we are witnessing the greatest arms buildup that our nation has seen since World War II. The scope, scale, and pace of the PRC's military expansion presents a formidable challenge that we must contend with deliberately. Our pace of modernization must reflect this reality. On the other hand, we operate in a time of increased global tensions, emergent conflicts, and increasingly brazen challenges to the order which has underwritten the prosperity of our country and the world, in fact, for the better part of the last century. It's essential that we meet the demand for the Marine Corps to maintain a high state of readiness today so that we continue to generate the forces necessary to campaign, deter, respond to crisis, and when required, fight. But we must do so while budgeting for the future readiness generated through modernization, our training enterprises, our installations, and the quality of life for our personnel. Fortunately for the Marines, we identified this challenge early and are already fielding many of the modernized capabilities developed through our force design initiative. Our fiscal year 25 budget request highlights our commitment to maintaining the balance between current and future readiness. We're requesting $17.4 billion for ops, uh, operations and maintenance in fiscal year 25. That's 32 percent of our total fiscal year request. That's to sustain our current and projected operational requirements in support of the joint force and national tasking. This operations and maintenance account funds our FSRM account that ensure our Marines have quality spaces in which to work and adequate barracks in which to live. But we're also seeking to gain momentum toward modernization. 65% of our budget request, 35.2 billion, supports our four pillars of force design. And I would also be remiss if I failed to mention the service's receipt of a clean audit opinion. Well, there's much to celebrate in being the first service in the DOD to accomplish this feat. The greater part of that victory is to be able to precisely tell you what we have done with every dollar and to show the American people that we are true stu stewards of every dollar that's accorded to us. The Marine Corps is appreciative of Congress's assistance and sustained support to take care of our Marines, to build our capacity and guarantee lethality. Your Marines are ready. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, General Slife. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? You absolutely are. Okay. Please proceed. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Chair Hirono, Ranking Mel Member Sullivan, distinguished members of the committee. The beginning and end of my testimony today is that your Air Force remains ready. Nevertheless, as Senator Sullivan pointed out in his opening con comments, the strategic landscape is as complex and dynamic as it's ever been, demanding the Air Force be ready for a spectrum of threats across differing time epochs. The rapidly evolving capabilities of the People's Republic of China demands our full attention. Meanwhile, Russia, North Korea, Iran, violent extremist organizations can't be ignored. At its most basic, the budget being considered by the committee today represents our best judgment on how to allocate risk over time, given the realities of the fiscal constraints and inflationary pressure inherent in today's environment. Could we retain greater force structure or additional platforms intended to be divested? You bet. But it would come at the expense of today's readiness levels or tomorrow's modernization, which is a proxy for tomorrow's readiness. Could we improve upon today's readiness? Absolutely. At the expense of force structure or modernization. And finally, could we modernize faster? We could, but it would come at the expense of either force structure or readiness. Such is the inescapable logic of allocating risk over time. While the budget before you may not be ideal in an absolute sense, we judge it to be ideal given the relative set of options and the strategic environment in which we exist. The Air Force's FY25 budget request makes several strategic adjustments that will help us maintain satisfactory readiness rates while investing in emerging technologies and modern systems to preserve future capability and capacity. Our personnel retention and accession rates are stable, 
Updated programs and policies aligned to DOD-wide standards are already resulting in a steady flow of new airmen. We're modifying incentive programs and investing in better infrastructure and support systems to make the decision to stay for airmen and families easier. We're also updating the way we train. We're rolling out immersive simulation technology and flight training improvements, maximizing the effectiveness of our pilots while airborne and providing realistic training for airmen on the ground. These new training methods are already increasing pilot production and helping our airmen prepare for operations in a contested environment. Our force presentation around the world is sufficient for the operational environment which has prevailed since the end of the Cold War. But the agile response needed tomorrow is gonna to require a more flexible approach. So our investments in agile combat employment will help us meet those challenges and train our airmen to execute hub and spoke models that enables the speed and lethality the future conflict will require. The Air Force's nuclear enterprise is undergoing much needed recapitalization and we look forward to bringing our system upgrades and new platforms to the front lines as soon as possible. Our FY25 requests will enhance our present nuclear capabilities and offer increased flexibility. The demand for finite resources is fierce and we strive to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars while delivering on our highest responsibility, air power in defense of our nation. The Air Force's FY25 budget request is not without risk, but it is acceptable risk to ensure our readiness today and tomorrow. On behalf of the 677,000 total force airmen and civilians, as well as their families, thank you for your support and steadfast devotion to ensuring that the Air Force maintains its place as the preeminent provider of air power anytime, anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. General Goodline. Chair Rono, Ranking Member Sullivan, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before this body and the American public on the military readiness of the United States Space Force and our continued efforts to sustain such readiness into the future. On behalf of the Secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Frank Kendall, and the Chief of Space Operations, General Chance Saltzman, I am honored to share with you our readiness vision for fiscal year 2025. Let me begin by saying that the context for any discussion on the readiness of the Joint Force lies on the nation's ability to achieve and maintain freedom of action in space through space superiority. The repeated actions by both the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China underscore the urgency for action. Although we still maintain control of the space over our adversaries, they are working hard to close the gap and assert their dominance in space. We cannot afford to let this happen. Space is the foundation for the, space, for the joint force and it is fundamental to our peaceful way of life. GPS alone is an essential part of every aspect of our daily lives from our cell phones to our banking systems and even our ability to get the crops out of the field and the groceries on the shelves. We cannot let our near peers competitors overtake us or we'll lose what we hold dear and the world will become a far more dangerous place. The investments provided in the president's budget maintain our marginal advantage. However, we must seriously consider future budgets in order to counter adversary investments and ensure our joint force remains the dominant joint force defending this great nation. As we look ahead, it is clear that the resources necessary to maintain the space capabilities the nation depends on are significantly outpaced by the demand. Our near peer competitors have not only made space a contested domain, but their activities in space reveal that their intentions differ profoundly from our own. Rather than ensuring peaceful access to space for all, they strive to seize control of space for their own aggressive purposes. The pace of their progress will only continue to accelerate because they are determined to close the capability gap and they are not subject to the same resource constraints we have, they are not subject to the same processes that we follow, and they do not share our values of protecting our environment both on Earth and in space for generations to come. Our guardians have clearly demonstrated the capability, the resolve, and the experience necessary to face the challenges posed by our competitors, but there is more to do. As Secretary Kendall and General Saltzman recently unveiled, the department is launching an effort to re-optimize how we organize, train, and equip our forces in light of great power competition and the looming threat. 
As part of this reoptimization, the Space Force is implementing a series of key initiatives that will directly impact readiness. First, we are standardizing the way we present space capabilities to the combatant commanders, and we are completing the stand-up and the resourcing of our service components in each of the combatant commands. This will ensure seamless integration of space capabilities into the joint force when called upon by the nation during times of crisis or conflict. Secondly, we are building joint warfighting leaders and preparing them for modern warfare. We are redesigning career paths, changing our readiness standards, and increasing the scope, tempo, and realism of our operational assessments and exercises in order to build the culture and proficiency necessary to prevail against the threat. This is the task that you created the United States Space Force for. Lastly, we are establishing a new field command focused on preparing the Space Force for future warfare. Space Futures Command will focus on developing future warfighting concepts and testing these concepts in modern, live, virtual, and constructive environments against realistic threats and focusing our investments on science and technology to counter the emerging threats. Space Futures Command will channel these lessons learned and technologies developed into a robust objective architecture and force design that will drive future resourcing decisions and readiness. I truly appreciate Congress's and this committee's continued support for our guardians and the mission. Your steadfast fiscal provisions have made us the force we are today and every guardian appreciates it. I look forward to working with you as we defeat tomorrow's challenges together and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Maurer. Good afternoon, Chair Hirono, Ranking Member Sullivan, other members and staff. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss key findings and recommendations from GAO's recent work on military readiness. And as you just heard, the services face difficult decisions about how to address continuing operational demands while preparing for future challenges. Today, we see that readiness is increasingly strained. Across the services, we've seen common challenges in three areas, sustaining weapon systems, generating ready forces, and balancing mission and resources. First, all too often the sustainment enterprise is not delivering mission capability. Less than 40% of ships completed maintenance on time. The F-35 and most aviation systems failed to meet annual mission capable or availability goals. And missile defense sustainment is optimized for specific systems rather than across the enterprise. Second, the services have at times struggled to align new equipment, units, and training to generate ready forces. For example, the Army and Space Force, to their credit, leaned forward in developing and fielding new technology, but they sometimes did not ensure units were trained, organized, and staffed to utilize these new capabilities. The Army and Marines also faced several personnel, sustainment, and organizational challenges establishing new multi-domain units. And shortfalls in training capability and other challenges hinder the Space Force's ability to generate space readiness. Third, we are increasingly concerned about a growing imbalance between mission and resources. The Navy does not have enough sailors for the current fleet, much less the fleet of the future. As we reported earlier this week, the Navy has 16% fewer sailors than required in the battle force. The Space Force is short 2,000 uniform guardians plus an undetermined number of civilians. Aviation and ship sustainment suffers from the lack of spare parts and shortages of trained maintenance personnel. And the Marine Corps faces a significant gap between the number and current condition of the amphibious fleet and near-term operational needs. Now to fill gaps like these, services have been doing more with less. They've prioritized mission and modernization, but to the detriment of facilities, housing, and barracks. Service members also face daunting trade-offs, sacrificing training, maintenance, and rest to meet operational needs. We recently reported that most service members consistently sleep six hours or less per day for months at a time. And that level of sleep deprivation can be like working while intoxicated. This overtaxing of military personnel creates safety problems, hinders readiness, and undercuts retention. The recommendations from our reports can help DOD enhance readiness. The 30 reports in my statement have 114 recommendations, and nearly all of those are open. Now, to be fair, most of those are directed to OSD, not the services. Many are relatively new, 
and few involve simple fixes. And prior to today's hearing, I had the opportunity to meet with everyone on the panel, and I can tell you they are committed to using the results of GAO's work to enhance readiness and improve conditions for service members. In fact, one of the best things about working at GAO is going to bases and units and talking to people at all levels of the military. We see service members and civilians consistently demonstrating professionalism and dedication to the mission. Your continued oversight, supported by our independent work, bolstered by DOD's actions to implement our recommendations, will help those service members address readiness challenges across the joint force. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. As long as uh, Ms. Moore pointed out uh, the, the fact that uh, their report suggested 114 recommendations and that you had met with the, the uh, testifiers today. So I'd like to ask all of you, starting with uh, uh, General Mingus, so of the 114 recommendations that GAO made, which one did you consider the, the most important to implement and uh, did you implement it? We'll just go down the list. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's hard to prioritize because they're all important and, then, and we agree with all the findings and the recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if I were to pick one, it would probably be our fleet readiness, our weapons readiness um, is one of the areas that we acknowledge ourselves and are keenly uh, focused on on reversing that trend. When you talk about fleet readiness, you're talking about what that there's there are a lot of elements that go into fleet readiness, Tanks, such as Bradley's our oh. howitzers, our fleet readiness currently is below uh, the standards that we hold for ourselves. And part of that is a confluence of cascading of uh, equipment from one unit to other back to depots. Some of it is equipment that we've given to Ukraine in the and the supply parts that have to go to Ukraine. And so it's been a, a host of things that have caused this. Uh, and it's our standard for most of our fleet is about 90% operational readiness rates. And we, if you aggregate across the fleet, it's, it's sitting at about 80%. So, uh, General, I would be interested to um, know how you're doing with the fleet readiness aspect of, of the GAO recommendations. So we will follow up with you on how you're doing with that. Yes, so, Admiral? Thanks, uh, Chair Hono. I, I think I agree with General Mingus. We we do take the GAO reports very seriously, read them, and try to really understand uh, where we can make progress in the forward direction. I would say three reports stand out. One, the rep most latest report on fatigue, which applies to all the services, but the GAO has done reports for the Navy fatigue. Uh, so. Those are, that's a serious report for us, especially given the Manning uh, situation that Ms. Maurer described. That's the second area, and that report was released on Monday. I haven't had a chance to completely digest the report, but there's much, much of it that we agree with and uh, concur. And then finally, the readiness reporting on availability and modernization and maintenance. Uh, those reports are impactful to us and, uh, and we are taking those very seriously. So as we go down the list, my intention is that for uh, the, the uh, recommendations that, that have been suggested, um, and as you point out to this committee, what you consider to be uh, an important recommendation that you are going to implement, I, my intention is to follow up to um, um, enable you to make those changes as suggested. So. We'll continue down the list. General Mahoney. Thanks, Senator. And uh, agree thematically with my shipmate and my fighting mate over here. But the one that stood out to me uh, as a leader of Marines was the report on the condition of the barracks. Mm -hmm. If we are going to say that the bedrock of our fighting capability is the individual Marine, we have to ensure that there is a safe sanitary a secure place for them to come back after after a hard day of training. That, that's the one that sticks out to me, man. Senator, thanks. Uh, so as I look through the work the GAO has done, uh, the portions that were most compelling to me uh, were the were the was the work that the GAO has done. Uh, actually, several reports on the F thirty five specifically. 
this is, of course, uh, the backbone of the Air Force's uh, future strike fighter fleet. Uh, it is a, it, in many ways, it is a fantastic uh, platform. It's a fantastic um, uh, capability we have but it's extraordinarily complex, and it's complex in a number of ways. Number one, uh, the, the structure of the program office where we have multiple partners and allies uh, that are involved in operating the platform, have a voice in how the platform is developed. Uh, clearly, the Department of the Air Force and the Department of the Navy uh, operate the U.S. fleets, and so there are differences in the way the Navy and the Marine Corps do supply in the way the Air Force does supply. And so anything that is a shared resource becomes very difficult for us to manage uh, just inside the Department of Defense, much less with, with our partners and allies. And then finally, as we've, we've found that we become more and more interdependent with our partners and allies, the interoperability of the platform itself. We have to be able to share data. We have to be able to use common weapons. We have to service each other's airplanes. Uh, there are bureaucratic impediments in place that we're working uh, hard to knock down that will allow us to get the maximum value out of that platform. But I would just tell you that uh, the short answer to your question is that the things that I find uh, most compelling in the GAO's work is is that related to the F-35. Well, good, because we've had issues with F-35 and, and, and its capabilities for what seems like um, a long time. Uh, so I, I would be interested to know how you're going to make the kind of changes that you just described. Okay, General Goodline. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we've had a pretty strong partnership with the GAO going forward since we stood up in 2019. One of the major pivots that we've been doing in the United States Space Force is pivoting to an employed-in-place approach to warfighting. Whereas the other services fight forward, we fight from the homeland. In facilities that are heavily driven by software, uh, we have to combine both our, our uh, men and women uniform, our civilians, and our contractors uh, to get after our mission, and that requires us to change the way we measure readiness. For example, we have to measure the power and cooling of our facilities. We have to balance FF FSRM resources with weapon system sustainment resources. So we needed a completely new model to measure our readiness so that we could accurately report to the combatant commanders what they could guarantee to be provided by the United States Space Force during times of crisis or conflict. We are in the middle of that pivot. We will finish that pivot by this fall. And what you have seen in our readiness numbers, because we are changing the way we do it, is a significant decline in our readiness reporting. It's not necessarily because we have changed anything other than the fact that we are actually looking at what does it take to go to the fight, which is different than the system that we inherited from the United States Air Force. Over. I think as a newest entity to be set up, it remains so to be seen how you're going to measure your attainment of mission. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I want to begin just because uh, a lot of these hearings are all about challenges and problems. I want to begin by just complimenting you gentlemen and the forces you lead. I mean, there's a million reasons to compliment you, but I'll just throw out a couple anecdotal ones. The Navy Admiral with regard to the Eisenhower deployment, the Kearney that I got a report saying it shot down close to 80 incoming uh, missiles and drones but fired by the Houthis. I mean, I know they're heading home right now, but those sailors did an amazing job. The Marine Corps, General Mahoney, you know, the full audit, I think that's actually a really big deal and a great example. Air Force uh, General Slife, the, the work that you did last year and a half, General Van Hurt called it Super Bowl level actions up in Alaska when we had these spy balloons and the Russian uh, bear bombers coming in, and we were intercepting, shooting down spy balloons, intercepting them, intercepting Russian bear bombers, young 25-year-old female F-22 pilots doing, I mean, the work that was going on up there, which you make look so simple, was remarkable. Um, General Mangus, I think you're given uh, pride and hope, you, just that 155 millimeter ammo. Look, I, some of my colleagues here are saying, hey, our industrial base can't produce like we used to. That's baloney, right? The Army's showing that right now, the way you were taking that uh, curve on the production of our ammo is remarkable. Um, 
And even, you know, with the Space Force, uh, General Gutling, you're, the, some of us were skeptical, myself included, the way you stood up. I think a lot of people have a lot of pride in the, in the Space Force. Um, your uniforms are almost as sharp as the Marine Corps, so that's another thing that I think is quite impressive. It's hard to do that. Um, so thank you, right? There's a lot going on here that's very important. But I do want to get to some of the challenges. Let me start, uh, General Mingus, with you and the Army's recruiting goals and the struggle to meet those, right? One of the reasons the Army is shrinking, which it is, is because we can't get enough Americans to volunteer. We are working on some of the issues. Senator Blumenthal and I actually are working on issues of access. We're going to probably legislate that, high schools and other places where we got much better, stronger, open access for recruiters. How are you feeling about that, General? What more can we do? Are we finally kind of hitting the bottom and coming up? I mean, if we keep missing recruiting goals at the level that some of the services have been, that's going to be the ultimate crisis because we can't man our force. Thank you, Senator. Um, so we acknowledge the last two years we missed the mark um, and not by a little bit. Yeah, the numbers were huge that so you Sec missed by. Secretary and the Chief and the entire Army have taken this on as a mission that we have to, have to succeed for all the reasons you pointed out. So our benchmarks this year are 55,000 in the door and another 5,000 in the delayed entry program for next year. And given the trajectories that we're on right now, uh, we had a very good spring and we're optimistic that we're, we'll meet those goals. So what did you do different? Like what happened? What's the corrective measures that you can learn from but other services could learn from? And I think many of these lessons are universal, but where I'll start is the restructuring of our recruiting command. Made it a direct report to, uh, to the Army. Uh, we're gonna upgun that to a uh, three-star. We're professionalizing our recruiting force, both on the warrant officer side and the NCO side, increasing the numbers that are actually in the field, looking at their locations, expanding the population is probably one of the biggest things. Instead of focused on juniors and seniors in high school, we're expanding that into college age. And are you it's getting college. access to those uh, institutions to your satisfaction, high schools and colleges? We, we believe for the most part, yes, sir. There's some challenges in certain parts of the country, uh, but the receptiveness is getting better. And then the last thing that uh, that we've done is what I mentioned in my remarks, and that's the Future, future Soldiers Prep course. We brought 18,000 through that program that would have not otherwise been able to meet the standard. Uh, we bring them in, in a, whether it's a, an academic or a cognitive or a physical issue, and we bring them up to our standard before we let them come through. And that's uh, the folks that have gone through that program, that 18,000 in excess of 90% of them have met the standard on the back end of that. Good, great. Well, look, if there's more that we can do as we're lo looking to mark up the NDAA, um, let us know. Um, um, Madam Chair, I have a bunch of other questions, but I'm going to, uh, my time's expired, so I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Sullivan. And I, I'll follow up with you, General Mingus, on the future soldier, because I'm intrigued with that. You say about 18,000 folks have come through. I spent some time down at Fort Eustis talking about this and was really impressed maybe 18 months ago. 90% um, are able to get to the standard by the end of that course. It hasn't been in place that long, but what are you find? I, I hope we're gonna longitudinally follow this group to see what we learn about retention. Did it not only enable them to meet the standard, but maybe prepare them to, hey, I really wanna stick with this. And probably a little bit too early to draw conclusions about that. Am I right about that? You are, sir. And we are absolutely gonna track everyone uh, from a longitudinal, longitudinal perspective, just to make sure we haven't created another problem. Uh, so far, uh, the data suggests that it's not. Uh, first term is on par with other first termers. And so as a result, uh, we're considering the expansion of, uh, you know, instead of just doing it in South Carolina, maybe expanding it to other basic training locations. Well, it'll be interesting over time to compare folks who went through future soldier with those who didn't and see if there's a different, you know, kind of a stickiness to their desire to, to stay. So I, I'll look forward to following that. And I know that many of the other services are, are watching carefully what you're doing and Navy and others are implementing too. So thanks for that. Here's an issue that I've, I've raised with a number of, of, of you and we've talked in the past. I'm really worried about the inadequacy of the labor supply on, in our industrial base. So you know the 45-day the shipbuilding analysis that was done, Admiral Kilby, you and I talked about 
this work done by the SECNAV directed to look at why are we so late on the Columbia, why are we so late on Ford class, Virginia class, and there's a number of reasons, but, but the workforce is a key one. And even when it's workforce plus supply chain, often the challenge on the supply chain is the workforce. So we see this really spread throughout, and I'm really nervous about it. Um, he, here's what I'm finding, though, that, that troubles me. Every year, military recruiters turn away thousands of young Americans who are disqualified from military service for one reason or another. And I've had interactions with some in the last 90 days. I wanted to serve my country, you know, and I, I passed through all the vetting and security check, but I had asthma in my background, or I had something else in my background that meant I was a no-go for entering the service. And I said, okay, when they tell you no, how'd you feel? I was really disappointed. And then did they say, hey, look, if you want to serve your country, you can still serve your country. Just because you can't come into the uniform service, there's DOD civilian positions. There's an industrial base that are essentially in the foxhole with our active service in terms of the critical nature. And my, my interaction with people who've recently been turned away is, no, they were given nothing other than a, I'm sorry, we can't let you in. I would hope that our services would direct patriotic people who want to serve this nation, who for one reason or another may not meet a qualification, I would hope that they might be directed to other parts of our defense um, ecosystem because, you know, we need an awful lot of people. We need the, the tens of thousands who exit military service every year who are going to go out into the big wide world and do anything. There's all kinds of opportunities for them to continue serving and I think many of them know that, but an awful lot of people, based on my son's experience, when he was a, you know, the, the really green first lieutenant and had his first Marine platoon and his uh, sergeant came and said, I'm, I'm retiring in 60 days, what should I do to find a job? I mean, th there ought to be ways to direct people into filling up these positions serving our country in the industrial base or the DOD civilian side. And I, I, I don't know that we're doing that. And I just would encourage you to see if we might be able to do that better. There's not a question there, but it's an encouragement. I do have a question about counter UAS in my last minute. We've been having some testimony and some hearings, some open, some classified, about UAS challenges. And obviously, they're a threat in combat. But increasingly, they're also a threat to our installations, both at home and overseas. Addressing this threat requires an awful lot of coordination. Uh, if, if it's at home, it's usually between a city or county and a state and a local law enforcement agency, and maybe the DHS or the FBI, as well as a base commander and others. And I worry a little bit that we're maybe not really coordinating as we are thinking about how to deal with the UAS threat around our own bases, both domestically and those that are overseas, where you have a foreign government also to deal with in terms of what you can do. How? How, are you satisfied with the degree of coordination um, that we are seeing in trying to get after the and solve this problem? Any of you? Want Sen to Senator, I'll answer that. But in 17 seconds, I can give you about 15 back because the answer <laughs> is no, mm -hmm. not satisfied. And the reason we're not satisfied is because although the services coordinate effectively uh, together and leverage each other's capabilities, Every single locale is its own story. And so there is no national approach uh, to this counter small UAS issue. It, it is local issue by local issue. I don't want to go over my time, but let me ask one other question really quick. If there was a, is there somebody in the Pentagon who I could like grab by the shoulders and say, hey, you're responsible for this, the coordination part of it. Admittedly, it's complicated with all the letterals, but you're responsible for this. Tell me what we are doing to really develop strategies. Who would I go to who is that person? I could be one of them. Uh, okay. Dr. Bill LaPlante, uh, ANS, um, Undersecretary for Defense for uh, ANS. He and I co-chair uh, the session that kind of leads this on behalf of the Secretary of Defense. Okay. okay. He stood up a Tiger team. That Tiger team's still in place, uh, Bill LaPlante and I. And there's a couple other forums that do this. And all the services are part of that forum that uh, Bill and I co-chair. But we would love to come back over Great. and give you a deep dive on that, sir. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you to you and the ranking member for having this subcommittee hearing. Um, and just to uh, pursue the line of questioning that uh, Senator Sullivan began, I think this recruiting issue will continue to challenge us, bedevil us, vex us for years to come, looking at the long range 
trends and the attitudes among young people. He and I are working to try to make high schools more accessible to your recruiters. And it's in their interest, our young people's interest, to know about what great opportunities there are for careers, not just jobs, but careers in the military and for their parents and their teachers to understand it as well. So um, I think we need to put together a, a broader program as Senator Sullivan and I have discussed. Just uh, to ask a question about this, General Mahoney, is the Marine Corps still hitting its recruiting targets? Yes, sir. Uh, we, we made uh, mission last year. We will make mission this year. Uh, the other part of uh, gaining and maintaining a skilled force is retention. And our retention mission uh, is very, very strong this year. For career Marines, uh, we we're over 100 percent, 110 percent. Uh, and for first-term enlistments, we're in the mid-90s. We will make those numbers. Interestingly and importantly, the numbers that we're keeping have a 95 percent specialty match against grade. So we're not keeping people that are not in the specialties that we want at the grade they want. So there are headwinds, and it is hard. And your recruiting force is out there working hard every day, but we will make mission. Um, I have three minutes left. I have a big question, which I would appreciate your answering in writing. Uh, what have we learned from Ukraine? If you could give that quick answer to me in writing, and I wouldn't have time, and I know we've been putting you on the spot. I do, uh, I would appreciate your addressing that issue to us in writing. Uh, let me ask you, Admiral Kilby, um, I am intensely interested in submarine production. I know Senator Kane shares that interest. We've reduced, according to the Navy's proposal, the number of submarines per year from two to one. I think that reduction without any disrespect is unacceptable. I don't know whether the Navy went along with it. I understand all the complexities of internal consideration. But uh, I know the Secretary of the Navy has focused on workforce as a major constraint. And so um, I'm, I'm interested that uh, in your testimony, you don't really address that issue in detail. There is a, a sentence or a paragraph uh, on page four that says, to this end, we are investing in public infrastructure and the industrial base aligned with the DOD National Defense Industrial Strategy, the Navy is in the midst of a generational change, et cetera. You know, um, one, one thing I did on the Armed Service Committee was to insert an apprenticeship program. This was five years ago and other kinds of training. My colleagues at the time said to me, this is education. This should be in the Department of Education. I said, no, it's a matter of national security. And so if that's the constraint on our building two submarines a year, we need to do something fairly dramatic about it. And I know you're operating within the DOD National Defense Industrial Strategy. Um, and then the shipyard infrastructure optimization program. Um, but the focus here seems to be main, mainly on capital investment, recapitalizing dry docks, et cetera. I want to see something on training and, you know, something major, something that meets this moment, because whether it's munitions or artillery uh, or submarines, we have a real challenge ahead. Hey, Senator, thank you. Um, I agree with you. Uh, the investments in the submarine industrial base are significant. Thank you for the supplemental. That's $3.4 billion. Our request that you're reviewing now is uh, $2.3 billion in FY25 and almost $9 billion across the fit-up. That's not just buying parts and things. It's workforce development. It's supplier base. It's all the things we think we need to do to bolster that uh, that base to produce those submarines. Our goal is to produce a Columbia and 2.33 Virginia class submarines by uh, 2028. In order to do that, we feel we need to make these investments. Well, thank you for your answer. Thank you for your service. Thank you all for your dedication and your great work for our country. And uh, I'll be following up on a number of these issues. Thanks so much. 
Thank you. I'm going to uh, call on myself for a second round of five minute questions. And then at that point, I believe uh, votes will be called. And then I will turn the hearing over to Senator Sullivan. And as long as all of you are here, he uh, can continue with the questions that he has. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I have mentioned this before to um, uh, others who have testified before the full committee, but Admiral Kirby, I do have significant concerns about the cost overruns associated with the replacement of Dry Dock 3 in Hawaii. Uh, it is a critically important project, and no sooner did we uh, did I speak at the, the, the one of the uh, important segments of the construction that I got a uh, inform I got a cost increase of uh, almost 900 million dollars. So over 400 million of which was due to poor planning on the Navy's part, meaning that, that uh, 400 million was due to the, the need to increase or, or to shorten the amount of time that it would take for this dry dock to be completed by almost one year. I would say that that is poor planning. So Admiral Kirby, what, uh, Kilby, what assurances can you give me and this committee that the Navy has cost overruns under control and that accountability steps are are being taken, being taken to address this issue. As Chair Hernando, thanks for that question. I share your concern. I am part of the uh, SIOP um, Oversight Committee. We meet uh, quarterly. Uh, to your specific question about Hawaii supervision, we have a uh, officer in charge of a construction activity at Pearl Harbor now in place to watch the QA and execution of that uh, performance of that work on Dry Dock 5. I, I do think it is a big effort to, once in a century effort to update these dry docks. They're complex. We are applying lessons learned. We're bringing industry in earlier to make sure we understand their voice. And that is captured in our estimates uh, to you. That's from Portsmouth applied to Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can't assure that you it won't happen again. I can assure that you, you have my attention and focus on it to try to ensure that this program is, is delivered as uh, we would like it to be delivered at a, and at the cost we predict it to be delivered at. I know that a, l a large part of that cost is attributable to other things such as uh, supply chain issues, et cetera, but to have uh, almost half of uh, that increased amount attributable to uh, lack of planning is very, very concerning. And so I'm asking um, for some level of assurance that that, that, that will be attended to. And I, and I'm a, I am hard pressed to identify a single large project that the Navy has undertaken that has come in on time and on budget. And if you can identify a project that has met those requirements, I would like to know what they are. But in the meantime, uh, for Ms. Marr, do you think, uh, do you have anything to add from the GAO, GAO perspective on what is going on with this massive cost overrun as far as I'm concerned on JADOC 5 in Hawaii? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Madam Chair. So we have uh, some open recommendations uh, to the Navy that they fully adopt some of the best practices and leading practices that GAO has established over many years on cost estimation and scheduling large projects like the project in, uh, in, at Pearl. Uh, our most recent report on, on the PSYOP effort last year, we had a, new, a couple of new recommendations that I think would be helpful. One is encouraging the Navy to take a look at design and risk analysis throughout the life cycle of large projects like what's going on at Pearl, mm -hmm. as well as to ensure that they are um, uh, seeking out the opportunity for independent cost estimates as well. Admiral Kilby, are you taking those uh, considerations in my, uh, to heart? <laughs> yes, we are, ma'am. Thank you. I will certainly follow up. Now, for General Mingus, uh, the Army is negotiating renewals for um, several training areas and land leases in Hawaii, very critical. Pohakaloa comes to mind. And if we don't, uh, rene if we don't negotiate that land lease in a, in a successfully, I think that it would very much compromise uh, the Army and, and the um, um, Marines ability to conduct these very needed exercises. But one of the requirements I, that I put into the last year's NDAA is there should be the, an official designated responsible for coordinating the lease 
negotiations and, and reaching out to particularly the Native Hawaiian community. And as far as I know, such a person has not been designated, even if I believe the time has passed. Can you update me on whether or not uh, a person has been identified? And if not, when uh, is that going to happen? Ma'am, bottom line is I think it's going to be very soon. The DEPSEC DEF uh, directed the stand-up of the cell itself in uh, January. Uh, they have not identified a lead, but uh, I think it is, it is very close. But we in the Army are taking this very seriously. As you know, General Flynn has been very engaged uh, since the beginning. He's held several town halls. We've had the environmental, initial environmental impact studies done. He's got another town hall the, coming up this month. Uh, we are attuned to the cultural sensitivities of this particular issue, absolutely. Um, and we also um, are attuned to the fact that 2029 seemed a long way, a ways away, but it's going to take us every day between now and then to get us there. And we look forward to working with you on this and your team as well. I cannot uh, uh, <laughs> make it any clearer how important uh, the, this aspect of the negotiations is because of, um, especially if there, are, if there are groups, particularly I would say the Native Hawaiian community for whom that, uh, that mountain on which Pohakaloa is located is a sacred mountain to them and, and uh, to not take that into consideration is going to be, a, uh, in my view, um, at our risk. Is my time up? I can't tell. No. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, Admiral Kilby, the Navy submitted a legislative proposal to Congress seeking authority to send up to six U.S.-based ships a year to foreign yards, i.e., uh, in Japan for repairs to prepare for potential contingencies. Now, while, while, while I'm in favor of keeping the ships we have in optimal conditions, I think it is short-sighted to outsource maintenance, especially when the Navy's own shipyards are in such disrepair, why PSYOP is so important. So for example, the surface ship repair piers in Pearl Harbor are in poor shape with only four of the 13 Berths available to conduct ship maintenance, I would think that we should be bringing those berths up to par as opposed to sending U.S. based ships uh, to other places to be maintained. So uh, instead of asking for authority to uh, do overseas maintenance on U.S. based ships, why isn't the Navy simply sending the ships already based overseas into these foreign yards for maintenance and repair. My understanding is there are dozens of ships already, for example, in, the, in, in Japan, for example, that could be repaired. Why ask to have ships that are in the U.S. sent off to these foreign places to be repaired? Can you respond to that, Admiral Kilby? Yes, I can, Chair Hirono. Thank you. The uh, concept behind the legislative proposal is to try to understand uh, where we have uh, places outside the United States in time of war that we could rely on repair of our ships. Uh, the general concept is uh, short duration availabilities for those ships that are on deployment from CONUS. Not to at all diminish the work we need to do at our domestic yards and for work packages. So I don't see, I don't see any impact. Uh, we, if anything, we can get some work done and do more work deeper when those ships return to their normal uh, schedule. So there's no desire here to, to impact our own industrial base at all and their ability to repair our ships. We would like to know, though, who our partner nations and their repair facilities are, who we can trust to send our ships should we need to do that. So it, it is meant to just explore and understand uh, where we have partnerships for your specific question about our four deployed ships, they uh, deploy on a different cycle. It's called a patrol cycle, both in Japan and Rota. So they typically go out for three months and come back for three months. And they have a, uh, a, an ecosystem within their own shipyards, whether they're Japan or Rota, to take care of those ships. So we understand how those work right now from a four de deployed naval force perspective. Well, frankly, before uh, I, I would be uh, convinced that we should authorize uh, the, these six ships, so I, I would definitely like to uh, engage with, uh, with you further so that we can be on the same page. Thank you. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Admiral, I want to continue following on shipbuilding. You know, the Secretary of the Navy's statement from April 9th, April 9th was kind of a shocker 
all four of the major programs, including the first Columbia class sub, the new block of Virginia class subs, the USS Enterprise carrier class, and the first Constellation class frigate are all several years behind in terms of shipbuilding. That's kind of as bad as it gets in my view, particularly when, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the PLA is cranking out 10 to 12 high-end ships a year. So um, more specifically, 66% um, of the attack submarine fleet in the U.S. Navy, um, only 66% of the attack sub fleet is available for, for operations. Amphibious ship readiness is at 32%, which is stunning. That impacts your um, United States Marine Corps. The latest fiasco at the USS Boxer deployment underscores a huge problem with amphibs. So my question, Admiral, I know you and I have talked about it. Let's assume there's no cost restraints. Let's assume there's no, uh, I mean, we have uh, workforce issues, uh, budget limitations. If you had a magic wand and you and you're very uh, smart and have a lot of experience in this world, what would you do to kind of start to fix this problem? One of the things I was disappointed in, the secretary puts out this statement, shocking statement to everybody. By the way, great statement if you're an American adversary, like, holy cow, look at that. These guys can't do anything right. Um, but there wasn't a plan to fix it. So what would be, if you had a magic wand, like, what would you do to fix it? And here's the reason I'm asking the question. This committee, we just had a strategy session this morning, all the Republican senators, we are ready to do big stuff. New shipyards, you know, I happen to think the idea that Senator Hirono was critical of you on, might make sense during wartime. Um, but what do we need to do? Because we're in kind of willingness mode. Everybody sees this as a crisis. But we need leadership from the Navy. And to be honest, uh, I don't think we have it. So what would, what would be the top three or four things? Again, no budget constraints, no nothing. Given your experience, here's what we should do. So two, two different parts of this question or this answer for you, Senator. Thank you for that. There's a ship production piece of that. Yeah. And there's a ship repair piece of that. So Correct. Let's, let's start out with a ship production piece. That's what the submarine industrial base investments are designed to get after. And they will also affect our, our repair business as well. But specifically, that will address our nuclear force, right? Those are what nuclear investments are, are made to get after. We also have a surface ship investment where we've invested almost a billion dollars to try to get a, suppliers and vendors to help our conventional the surface ship as well. You've highlighted the, the issues, at least at some of the yards, the production yards are workforce, and yeah. I would say experience workforce. So we've, in some yards, we have a very green workforce, so we've lost years of experience through a number of things, and we have to build that up. Yeah which comes from workforce development and the investments we're trying to make. So I think there's a piece of that where we just have to make those investments and let them take and, and monitor and watch the input, watch it take hold and see if it's trending the way we think it should trend. From the repair perspective, we need to get after the business of how we do uh, shipyard maintenance, both in our private yards and our public yards. Do we need more shipyards, either private or public sh shipyards for the U.S. Navy? I think it would be helpful to have, this is an indirect answer. I'm not sure if I need more shipyards to make ships. I need more yards that can outsource work if those shipyards can't handle it. And we're doing- On the maintenance work. side or um, on the production side? I think both. both. I think both, sir. Okay. And, and I think some of those yards could help our, our uh, nuclear community as well, as long as they're qualified yeah. and, and pass uh, standards. How about that. the disaggregation of I've been digging into shipbuilding a lot, as much as I can. My team has. What I mean is it makes sense to build, you know, subs and carriers. And, I mean, should our yards be, hey, this is only subs. This is only carriers. This is only frigates. This is only, can we do that? Is, is that kind of specialization helpful in terms of the ability to crank out ships? Uh, I'm not sure. I'll have to 
take that question and get back to you, Senator. You know, uh, Hunting and Ingles in uh, Pascagoula does a, a great job. They have a wonderful plant where they're able to produce multiple ships. Yeah. So it can be done. Uh, I think there's a there's a real estate piece of that, the size of the yard and their ability to to uh, be able to handle multiple lines and are they facilitized to use computer-aided design? I think that is ultimately helpful to them as well. Okay. Okay, well, I'll tell you this, Admiral. There is a lot of interest in helping the Navy, a lot. And if you guys have big ideas, my own view is this committee would embrace them. Big ideas. Because we got to get around... We got to get by this. If the Chinese keep cranking out 10 to 12 ships a year and we're struggling the way the secretary, you know, in his statement put it out, we are going to be in a real big hurt locker uh, if we're not already in one. Uh, let me ask General Mahoney a related question. You know, the ARGMU team is one of the most important elements of American readiness. Um, you know, I I, uh, we, I mentioned the amphibious readiness at 32%. I mean, holy cow, that's just, there hasn't been a, no ARG has been ready on time in the past two years in the indo Paycom theater, our most important theater. Again, that makes the Chinese happy. Um, and then, General, uh, the Marine Corps has said, um, in terms of force design, the Marine Littoral Regiments uh, need about nine LSMs per MLR. The Navy, I think, is on budget to produce eight LSMs by the early 2030s. So that is a giant disconnect with what you guys say you need in terms of force design and what the Navy is producing. Um, publicly, the Marine Corps has been saying, well, the LSM procurement plan seems fine, but the LSM procurement plan, from my math, doesn't seem to add up at all. If you need nine LSMs for each Marine Littoral Regiment, and there's three Marine Littoral Regiment, that's 27 LSMs. The Navy right now is saying you'll get eight by the mid-2030s. So isn't that undermining amphibious readiness in terms of the Marine Corps' new force design as well, General? Senator, thanks. Uh, the LSM, as you rightly noted, is a key enabler for the movement, mobility, and sustainability uh, of the MLR in the littorals. It is late to need. The initial uh, procurement year was supposed to be 22. The way it's programmed right now is a single ship in 25, one in 26, and then two each in 27 uh, and 29. If I got that right, 27, 28, and 29 for a total of eight. You are correct. Um, we shouldn't, we won't see critical mass until the early 30s for in pursuit of our requirement of 35. Between then and now, what we have done to fill that gap, vice just stare at it. I uh, have invested in leased vessels, uh, invested in alternate platforms, uh, expeditionary fast transport. But those are clearly suboptimal. They are not ideal, to, uh, Senator. LSM, correct. correct. As, a, as a bridging solution, they are not ideal. I mean, I, I appreciate the Marine Corps getting on the issue and having a bridging solution. But, you know, as I've said in many hearings, and I'm going to ask about force design here in a second, but if the Navy's not invested in force design, Marine Corps force design will fail. I think that's just a fact. And I just worry that on a basic concept as important as LSMs, as it relates to Marine littoral regiments, it doesn't look like the Navy's invested. We have the investment in this, in this budget, sir, but I'll say we need to go faster. As okay. you pointed out in your opening statement, we can't have our adversaries putting 10, 12 ships in the water, and we're worried about building, uh, you know, less than that. So, General, let me, let me pivot directly to some of the Marine Corps force design issues. The Marine Corps recently decided to reactivate at, uh, HMLA 269, which was deactivated in 2022 in accordance with initial force design 
plans. One of the major criticisms of force design was General Berger's divest now to invest later strategy, where there was a very significant divestment of proven combat power for future weapon systems to come on board, leaving a gap in combat capability. Um, General Smith has said that he would recalibrate force design to meet emerging threats. Obviously, this HMLA 269 decision is a recalibration, which I think it's good to see him doing that. What other examples of recalibration can you provide the committee with with regard to force design that the Marine Corps is either undertaking or contemplating? And are you still focused on three MLRs or is that now going to two? Senator, one of the one of the parts of the force design thesis was to take your assumptions, challenge them, validate them, war game them, test them, learn from them, and, and refine. In the case of HMLA, which went from seven squadrons, originally envisioned to five, and then we adjusted in that calibration of our assumption, cut us too thin, uh, back to six, four on the West Coast and two on the East Coast. Uh, we're looking at the same for assault support capacity with our heavy lift when CH-53K comes aboard. So that's another force design recalibration that you're looking to add back heavy helo lift capability that was cut as part of force design? As part of inventory management, yes, Senator. What about your F-35 cuts that were pretty dramatic? Just as a, as a matter of clarity, none of the programs were cut. We have bought... The HMLA program, 369 airplanes, 189 AHs, 160, I think, H1s. We have bought out the V-22 program. We've bought out KC-130s, and we will buy out 200 uh, CH-53Ks. What we're doing within that buy is, is managing the inventory based on global force management, based on MAGTAF training, based on uh, individual and organic training, making sure that we can make that, that demand and managing the fleet accordingly. It's not, we didn't divest any tails, so to speak. Right, but they weren't going out to the fleet. Uh, some of them weren't going out to the fleet. That, that would be correct. There would, there would be, uh, the fleet would drive the demand and then we would adjust the inventory to, to meet that demand. Let they me started ask, flying F-18s, uh, and they were engineered for 5,000 hours. Let me ask real quick. The Boxer, how, how uh, significant is that to West Coast mu arg readiness? All the big decks are critical. We're, we're out of balance right now. The, the statute calls for 10. We have nine. When Bougainville devil, uh, delivers, we'll have 10. And have you been in contact with your Navy comrades here on this very critical topic that's the Navy Marine Corps team? Yeah, constant contact, sir. Okay. Um, let me ask General Mingus. I'm going to get back to you. Um, 11th Airborne Division, uh, as far as I can tell, maybe you can provide me an update. Um, morale is good. Uh, we love this unit in Alaska. One of the things, though, that I've – been a little bit concerned about is the MTO uh, recognition of the higher costs of operating in the Arctic, just across the board. The ability to do anything, the ability to have wep weapon systems that work in 20 below, the ability to have the equipment, the gear. So um, snow tires, right? I mean, these are all big issues and they cost more. So you and I have talked about it. I just want to kind of in this hearing, get your commitment that as you're looking at the cost requirements, the MTO of the 11th Airborne, uh, that it's going to reflect the additional costs that would be appropriate for the operations that this unit is doing in Alaska. And don't just cookie cut, hey, you got the 11th Airborne in Alaska, the 82nd Airborne on the East Coast, we're going to make the costs the same. Well, they're not the same. And to have success in Alaska, it's probably going to cost more with that airborne unit. Can you comment on that, General? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, not only do you have my commitment to you, but 
I also have no choice because the chief staff of the Army has directed me to fix it, and so I, that, that is my goal. Uh, Good. It's one of the reasons why I personally went up there here just a little while ago. And did you would you agree with my assessment that the cost of just yeah. operating in that environment is not going to be what the 82nd Airborne yes, sir. deals with? And it's going to be um, more because they still have to be able to go fight in the jungle, too. Right. And so they have to have equipment to go to the Philippines or go to Japan or go to South Korea. But they also have to be able to operate in Alaska. And so they are going to have a very unique MTO. And it's not just the equipment. It's the mechanics and all the other things that go with it to sustain it and maintain it and, uh, and ensure that it, it operates in that uh, environment. And so it's physically in the building with me now. We are working that. So when I was up there... I told Brian Eifler, hey, personally send it to me. I've got it because we don't want this to be a bottom-up. We want it to be a top-down driven process, and that's what we're doing now, sir. Thank you. And how is morale up there when you were there with that unit? You know, we've had a – I think General um, Eifler's done a great job up there, but, you know, we've had this very high-level rash of suicides, shockingly high, that – you know, you never want to jinx it, but it seems to be under control. Do you think that's because these soldiers have a really good mission, really good training, um, you know, a really good unit, right? The 11th Airborne is this very storied unit that you guys reactivated, which I think was great. What's your sense of the morale there? And do you think we have, again, I don't want to, you never want to jinx it, but do you think we have that very troubling issue of high Suicide rates more under control in Alaska? So the data suggests the trends are all moving in the right direction. And I don't want to overcharacterize based on a single visit, but my sense when I was up there is that uh, that unit is in very good shape. Um, probably the single biggest thing that is beyond the leadership, which is the biggest thing. Uh, the leadership up there has really taken a hold of this and uh, owned it. Uh, but just the conversion into a mission that they can actually accomplish yeah. as they move from a striker to a light brigade, they've embraced that. Uh, the the uh, climate and the culture associated with a light infantry brigade, uh, it really fits much, much better for yeah. them up in there. Tough training, hard training. Um, and then that headquarters now is a warfighting headquarters versus a admin headquarters, correct? That is correct, sir. Uh, okay, thank you very much. General Slife, I wanted to follow up on our conversation just the other day. I appreciated all the time you gave me uh, two days ago in my office. On the 18th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, I appreciate, again, the pressures that the Air Force is under. As I mentioned, that's actually a pretty motivated dual mission with some great airmen who are doing great work, both as uh, Red Air for the J Park red flag uh, exercises. And then they're going out and intercepting bear bombers who are, doesn't make the news down here in the lower 48, but the Russians are doing bear bomber runs against Alaska every month now, sometimes with, with um, armed escort fighters. And your young men and women are going on intercepting these guys, that unit. Um, how are we optimizing that given the cuts that the Air Force had, but I, just was chatting with General Nahum this morning. The plans that seem to make a lot of sense, even though you're trying to get rid of these F-16s, can we be assured that that's gonna, that unit will stay there in that dual capacity role? And do you think that's the appropriate dual capacity role? As you know, it frees up our fifth gen fighters to do the high end fight as opposed to sitting alert, you know, F-22 sitting alert mission, getting ready to go uh, intercept Russian bear bombers in Alaska, but what, what's your assessment on that, General? Uh, Senator, we think it's a winning idea. Uh, we intend to keep that unit there, and uh, I expect that we will um, uh, be able to retain 12 aircraft there. Uh, I believe what you and I talked about was 10, which we judged to be the minimum. But, you know, budgets are a snapshot in time, and as we've gotten more experience operating uh, that squadron in the new mission, uh, we believe that we can uh, maintain it at 12 aircraft and we will continue to evaluate what the right size of that unit is in future budget cycles. But yes, uh, we intend to keep it there. Great. Um, let me ask, you know, I asked uh, Secretary Kendall about the KC-135 bed down at Eielson. Um, you know, I've been talking about this issue for a long time with the KC-46s and you know, he see, like I'm a big fan of Secretary Kendall. Surprisingly to me in his posture hearing, he seemed to walk that commitment back a little bit. 
which kind of surprised me. I, I take very much your good counsel. You provided me uh, in our meeting recently about, hey, this is an all in. We got to make sure we deal with the housing and schools. And I get that. I think it's a really important point that you were raising. I've already raised that with some of our leadership back home in Alaska. But um, we're going to keep working the housing issue. Uh, that's really important, and we understand that. But um, can you reaffirm that commitment on the KC-135? That is a important issue. It strategically makes complete sense, as you know, given how strategically positioned Alaska is. Um, again, I was a little surprised Secretary Kendall, who had made several commitments to me on this, seemed to be walking that commitment back in his posture hearing, which um, you know I'm concerned about. Yes, sir, I can. I can reaffirm the commitment. <clears throat> we have, uh, we've already moved one additional KC-135 there, uh, and as soon as we can work through some of the infrastructure issues and so forth, as uh, we talked about, we remain committed to putting the other three there as well, just as soon as we can. Great, thank you on that. Um, General Mahoney, I wanna go back to force design, and um, you know, one element that uh, was moving forward under General Berger, then it kind of got dropped. I'm sorry, under General Neller, then it was kind of got dropped. Was a was this idea of kind of much more high end Marine Corps training in Alaska? Um, I had a good uh, phone call with uh, General Smith the other day. As you know, he and I were planning on going up uh, to Alaska to to walk the ground. But in terms of you know training which is second to none in my state. The ability to do kind of littoral regiment training on the Aleutian Island chain, that's a very real world mission. You got Russian and Chinese joint naval task force coming to, off the coast of Alaska the last two summers, big ones, 12 ship joint naval task force last summer, putting an MLR on the Aleutian Islands with, you know, capable weapon systems to take out Chinese and Russian ships would have been nice to have. Um, the ability to train year round, you know, one point General Berger told me you can only train six months out of the year in Alaska. Hmm. Still wondering what six months he was talking about. It's the best training in the world. Um, you have joint forces that would love to train with you. J Park is the best air training probably on the planet Earth. Um, that you can do combine and joint operations. The Marine Corps, in my view, certainly needs to get back to cold weather training. Of course, we do some in Norway, but um, high-end stuff you can do in Alaska. And then you're close, right, to Japan, to Korea, to Taiwan, if the balloon goes up. So um, uh, my discussion with General Smith was uh, really uh, positive on that. Can you give me an update from your perspective on on the potential of this issue. Like I said, it was something that seemed to have a lot of momentum under General Neller. It wasn't even something I was involved in. It was just what the Marine Corps was doing. Then it lost momentum under General Berger. And I think it makes sense strategically, training-wise, uh, for the Corps to look hard at this. Senator, thanks. And I, and I agree with you as a, as a fighter pilot who did the yield Cope Thunder uh, days of old in Alaska, then red, uh, red flags, Cope Thunders, uh, Northern Edges, Arctic Response. Uh, that training range is, is outstanding. Uh, <coughs> General Smith has re-energized uh, our ops section, and I think he is committed to sending uh, our PP&O, yeah. DC Aviation, and importantly, uh, Marine Forces Reserve to right. look at our reserve component and how they can also uh, align to uh, exercising in Alaska. Great. Well, I look forward to working with you and General Smith and the entire leadership team uh, General, uh, on that issue. So thank you on that. General Cutler, and I, I wanted to uh, mention in terms of uh, the facilities and infrastructure that are crucial to the Space Force mission. Um, I know that you're in that process of, I think you've already handed off the long-range discrimination radar system at Clear Air Force Base uh, in Alaska that is now fully Space Force. What do you need from the Congress, if anything, on transitioning not just those kind of facilities, um, 
the ones in Alaska, but also any other place in the U.S. that relates to infrastructure, to the Space Force's needs that may have been or may, might still be Air Force infrastructure, and how's that going? Senator, we have taken responsibility for all of our FS, FSRM and MILCON uh, globally. So are you done with that? Like that, that transition with the Air Force is complete? From a Mission funding complete. perspective and ownership, yes, sir. Including we, CLEAR? Including CLEAR, but we still rely on the Air Force for the non-core space functions. So our CE members are Air Force members. Our security forces are Air Force members. And do you plan on changing that or that's just going to be a joint kind of capability that you're now sharing with the Air Force? Sir, that will be, for the foreseeable future, that will be the arrangement and the relationship that we have with the United States Air Force. When we stood up the Space Force, we intentionally stood it up to be lean and flat. We only took on the core space functions of space operations, uh, uh, intelligence, cyber, and uh, force modernization. Can I ask uh, one issue? I've raised it with the chief of staff of the Air Force. I just want to put on your radar. So my understanding is that the deployments still out at clear are one-year unaccompanied deployments. Correct. Um, you know, you might have an intrepid young captain who wants to bring her husband and her three kids to Alaska for a two-year deployment or a three-year deployment. Um, there's a wonderful community in Inanna that's only about 15 miles away that would love to host Air Force families. Um, I, the last time I checked into this, that the Air Force, and now I guess the Space Force, um, has said that if there is a desire for a, uh, not a forced unaccompanied tour, but a two-year tour or three-year tour with family, that you would consider it on a case-by-case -case basis? Am I, am I describing that policy correctly? Or do you know or you want to get back to me on that? You are, but I'd like to get back to you with the full details. Because okay. we have both guardians and airmen. Oh, I know it's clear. Little... And I want to make sure our policies are aligned. But I do believe that is the way we are approaching So I, I think it would be best for the community and the airmen to... Look, nobody likes doing one-year unaccompanied tours. They're hard on families. They're hard on... If there was a way that you could start looking at that, again, don't force it, but... If a young captain wants to come up with his husband or her husband and uh, kids, you know, I know certain groups would love that. It's adventurous, it's beautiful, um, and the communities there would love to embrace them. So it's just a thought that we want to kind of build on. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. It, it is a beautiful area. Yeah. And really, by the way, another great thing that you guys did, that... I mean, you tell me, that's the most sophisticated ground-based radar site on the planet Earth, and you guys built that on time, under budget. Which Correct. Is pretty and that was, that was one of my responsibilities at the Missile Defense Agency was building that site, and it is an amazing radar. Yeah, it is. on the planet. It is amazing. Um, so thank you on that. And then finally, Mr. Maurer, uh, you got 120 re recommendations, and give me your top three for readiness and lethality in the ability to beat the Chinese in a war? Your top three. Sure. Um, I'm going to talk in clusters of recommendations. If that's oh, okay. you're kind of cheating, but I that's know, okay. I know, I know. Um, so I would put F-35 sustainment in that bucket. F-35. As is, number one? As, as number one, because that's vital not only to the Air Force, but it's a critical part of what the Marine Corps and the Navy uh, want to accomplish and need to accomplish, not just today, but obviously in the future. Second bucket has to do with fixing uh, Navy uh, ship sustainment and more specifically sh Navy ship maintenance. There are a lot of different aspects of that. I think that's going to be a critical thing to keep following on. And, and does your report have big think, bold ideas on that issue? We think that we've had a whole series of reports with a number of recommendations to fix Navy maintenance at the depot level, the intermediate level. We have a draft report we're doing right now on sailor-led maintenance that have some big, bold recommendations that'll be coming out uh, later on this year. Great. And the third, the third cluster is around this issue of uh, force generation sort of writ large. You know, there's a lot of talk and a lot of focus on developing and deploying new technology, and that's tremendous, but the real challenges start once the new technology is available. So recommendations around making sure there's sufficient facilities, sufficient training, that there's a, a sufficient logistics system and, and structure put in place to fully enable the services to, 
take advantage of those technologies. And that theme cuts across a lot of different reports and recommendations. Great, great work. Thank well, you. again, I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. I want to thank all the witnesses for your literally decades of service to our country. Um, we very much appreciate it for your leadership. Uh, the members of the committee will have two weeks in which to submit uh, additional questions for the record. We respectfully uh, request that you get those um, back to this committee in, a, in short order. I don't know what the official timeline is, but some quick time turnaround. And uh, we look forward to working with the leadership of all the services and GAO on these important issues. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, General Inman and Ms. Maurer for your exceptional uh, service and excellent testimony today. This hearing is adjourned.